I'm delighted to be here and I'm honored to be called upon to give this talk and I'm going to talk about um, the history and structure of ethnic India using essentially uh, DNA molecules for reconstruction. Um, humans, as we all know, evolved in Africa about 130,000 years ago. When I mention these dates, these dates you have to take with a sort of large grain of salt because there will be uh, considerable margin of error in these dates. So it could be somewhere between 100,000 to 150,000 uh, when we evolved in Africa. Uh, and we moved out of Africa and there's a very nice uh, film that's been made that's co also called The Out of Africa, uh, starring um, Robert Redford and uh, Meryl Streep. We moved out of Africa about, uh, uh, we evolved somewhere in Africa, in possibly in the Ethiopia, Kenya region. We were a small group of people when we evolved, and uh, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. They uh, essentially hunted deer, hare, etc. They gathered nuts and berries uh, from, from whatever was around them. They looked like us. They had a high forehead, sharp chin, light and graceful bodies. And this could be one of us, but this is one of our great, great, great ancestors. Um, so that's, that's what a reconstruction um, uh, of our ancestors looks like. At the time when we were evolving in Africa and before we came out of Africa, there were many other human likes. Not humans, but similar to humans on the path to humans probably. Uh, many other human likes lived elsewhere in Africa, notably in Asia and Europe at that time. And this is about 100,000 years ago. Um, these uh, human likes were noticeably different from us. They had low forehead, heavy ridges above the eyes, and so on. These uh, human likes were called archaic humans. Uh, not exactly humans, but archaic humans. And they were, it's estimated that there were about a million of them when we came out of Africa. And uh, over a short period of time, uh, about uh, the last of them um, lived about 30,000 years ago, in a relatively short period of time, all of these archaic humans vanished. Uh, it remains an enigma as to how these uh, archaic humans have vanished. Um, and there are several theories. Uh, we will never know how they vanished. Uh, there are several theories, like I said, and one of the theories is that we over-reproduced. We were much better reproducers than um, our predecessors. So we over-reproduced, meaning that we had a larger number of children uh, per couple. Uh, and therefore, we were able to outnumber them, and once we outnumbered them, we probably killed them. So extermination is a hypothesis that was, um, extermination by killing was a hypothesis that was uh, propounded, and we will see what, uh, we, th this hypothesis has become testable uh, because of uh, DNA evidence, and we will see uh, whether this is a, uh, th this hypothesis is tenable or not, or what, whether there are other competing hypotheses as uh, will emerge from DNA evidence. So like I said, we evolved in Africa. We came out of Africa between 80 and 60,000 years ago. Again, these dates are, we cannot pinpoint a date, but during that period of time, we came out of Africa. Today, there are over 6 billion of us, probably close to 7 billion of us. Um, every one of us descended from that small group of anatomically modern humans that evolved in Africa. And, uh, the point is that most of the um, uh, reconstruction of human evolution, most of the reconstruction of human ancestry and our past have been done using fossil remains. Um, there were millions of humans who have lived and died, but fossilized remains of only a few hundred exist, and, uh, or, or at least have been discovered. So what we try to do is to, dis, uh, to take these fossil remains, most of which are fragmented, a broken skull, one bone, a toe bone, or something of that kind, and uh, we try and reconstruct human evolution using fossil bones. Um, and to reconstruct our footprints on the sands of time, using only data from fossil remains imposes a heavy, heavy burden of speculation. And of course, you can imagine that from a bro broken skull, you have to make a, a you have to uh, speculate a lot in order to be able to figure out how that particular skull relates to other skulls that one has discovered in that general area and in a geographical uh, space far away. Um, in recent times, and when I say recent, maybe in the last thirty years or so, um, it's been possible for us to 
isolated DNA even from fossil remains. And so another source of evidence that has become available to us uh, for reconstruction of human evolution is DNA. And so what, for the rest of my talk, what I'm going to do is to uh, give you DNA evidence and try and reconstruct human evolution using DNA evidence. Like I said, when we came out of Africa about between 80 and 60,000 years ago, uh, we found that we were not alone. There were many human likes who were outside of um, uh, Africa, mostly in Europe and Asia. Uh, and there we met some cousins, some of our cousins, and we met at least two other hominid species um, in the Eurasian landmass when we came out of Africa. And one of them we know, we are all familiar with the Neanderthal man, and this is a skull of a Neanderthal. And uh, so like I said, that one of the species was Neanderthal, the other species some of you may have heard, some of you may not be familiar with uh, the Denisovans. So Denisova is a cave in Siberia where a finger bone was found and uh, this finger bone was initially speculated to belong to a Neanderthal but uh, when DNA was isolated and sequenced, similarly the DNA, Neanderthal DNA was sequenced before then and these two DNA sequences were compared, the amount of, uh, the, uh, the, the number of DNA sequence differences was so large that it could not have been um, this, the, the, the DNA that belonged to this finger bone could not have come from a Neanderthal. So again, I'm not going to uh, provide any elaboration of this. The fact remains that this was classified separately uh, from Neanderthal. So uh, essentially because this was the Denisovan cave from which this finger bone was found, these were called the Denisovans um, uh, like the Neanderthals. So we met two cousins, two different species, Neanderthals and the Denisovans. And uh, what one found after one did a DNA analysis is the following. So this is the group of modern humans, Oceania, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Um, humans uh, sampled from all of these land masses, their DNA isolated and sequenced and analyzed. And similarly, we had one DNA sequence of the Denisovans, and we had multiple DNA sequences of the Neanderthals taken from various parts of Europe, or um, the, the fossils were um, identified and discovered and identified in different parts of Europe. Um, uh, DNA was isolated and the DNA was sequenced. So we had at least four DNA sequences of the Neanderthals. We had one Denisovan sequence and a whole series of sequences, DNA sequences of modern humans. A lot of comparative studies were done and what was found is the following. That when you look at modern human genomes, you find that there are traces of Neanderthal genomes in the modern human genome. You also find that there are traces of Denisovan genomes in the modern human genome. And the only explanation of this was that there was introgression of the um, uh, Neanderthal genome into the human genome and also of the Denisovan genome into the human genome. I'm only focusing on the human, I'm not telling you about the relationship between our cousins. So, this kind of introgression does not take place without mating. So uh, the uh, individuals have to mate for these kinds of introgression to take place. There is yet another way in which such introgression can take place, which is DNA, bits and pieces of DNA can be carried by viruses or transposons, but we now know that there are transposons and viruses leave a telltale mark on the genome and we know that this movement from the Neanderthal genome or the Denisovan genome into the modern human genome could not have been could not have taken place by transposition or even by um, uh, viruses carried by viruses. So it necessarily had to be introgression by mating, which essentially means that they made love, not war. Remember, I said that one of the theories that 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 was very popular is that we killed the one million cousins that we uh, whom we met when we came out of Africa, it now seems that, or it now seems from DNA evidence uh, that we did not actually kill them, we mated with them, and if we mated with them, we of, co of course made love and not war. So essentially, we mated with both Neanderthals and with Denisovans, and that's how the DNA got introgressed into our genomes. Uh, also, there was another interesting find that if you look at the modern human genome, 
Um, of course, you find most of it as be belonging to the human, but also uh, you find bits and pieces of the Neanderthal and Denisovan, and then there were some bits and pieces of the DNA, of the modern human DNA, that could not have come from the Neanderthal or the, Den or the Denisovans, and so it was uh, said that there is probably a potential unknown hominin. Hominins are these archaic humans on the path to um, becoming a human. Um, so, the unknown, or potential unknown hominin, whose fossil has never been uh, found, but there are, uh, uh, there are um, uh, evidence, there is evidence that um, human genome contains bits and pieces of an alien genome, and that <laughs> alien genome, um, gen genome's um, uh, fossil has never been found. I have a little bit more to say about this. Um, so what, uh, what we, um, how do we infer these kinds of things? First, we generate genome scale data from relevant species or individuals. So these are in the three species in, under consideration are the Denisovans, the Neanderthals, and the humans. Then we set up plausible scenarios. We set up plausible ev evolutionary scenarios. And we test these scenarios using statistical analysis of genome scale data. And whichever scenario gets the biggest statistical support from the genome scale data is what we consider to have uh, to be to be the true model of evolution. So in this case, of course, as you know that if you look, if you sequence individuals, you will get these long stretches of ATs, Gs, and Cs. Uh, each row belongs to an individual. If you look at uh, columns, if you look at um, you know, the first column, for example, there is no variation. So most columns will be uh, will not be variable. Will have the same nucleotide across individuals, which essentially means that most of us share large quantities of DNA. Uh, across um, across ourselves, meaning inter inter individually, but there are certain positions where you find variation, and these are the positions that are informative for evolutionary analysis. The other positions where there is no variability cannot be informative for evolutionary analysis. So it's these positions that we actually target in order to draw our inferences. Um, so there are multiple variable positions. So like I said, we set up plausible scenarios. So we, for example, if we want to distinguish between two scenarios of introgression into archaic humans, one scenario, again, I'm not going to get into the details, these are multiple species, and one scenario is that this particular species introgressed here, and therefore their genome, uh, this, this species genomes have been found here. So it's only found in this, uh, this, this, a particular branch of the phylogeny, it will not be found in these species and it will not be found in these species because this is where the integration event took place. The other alternative would be, for example, that the integration event took place here and if it took place here, all of the uh, descending descendant species would have bits and pieces of their DNA. Then we collect data and we see, uh, so the, the, the red ones are the observed and the blue ones are the expected, expected under this model, and here the blue one is expected under this particular evolutionary model. So what we now do is to figure out whether the observed and expected are, uh, are more similar under this scenario or under this scenario. Whichever scenario it turns out to be more similar, we see that that's the appropriate model of evolution. So this is this is uh, the, the 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 way that uh, we um, uh, draw inferences in human evolution or any evolution for that matter, and that's how we do it. Now what I'm going to tell you is that if you look at these three genomes, and these are three genome sequences, this is predominantly black, this is pre predominantly green, and this is uh, uh, red, and this is predominantly green. Um, in the black genome, you also find bits and pieces of red and green. In the red genome, you find bits and pieces of black and green, and in the uh, in the green genome, you find bits and pieces of red and black. Uh, one question that arises is, where did this red piece come from? And of course, this is a cartoon. Uh, we actually do statistical analysis to test whether this red gene has uh, the, the the red position has come from this, and that will be the most likely. Um, uh, source of this DNA material. So if you look at this particular black in the green genome background, this black must have arisen from uh, that because that's, that, that genome contains the maximum amount of black and therefore this particular um, segment must have arisen from that genome. Uh, similarly, these, uh, these red pieces must have arisen from there. And if you want to look at this red piece, that red piece must have arisen from this genome, similarly, etc. So this, this is very intuitive. We can do formal statistical analysis and validate the intuition, but this is uh, quite obvious 
uh, from where these uh, bits and pieces of uh, genomes have arisen. So if you look at these three genomes, essentially, uh, these three genomes are cartoons of three different genomes. One's a Neanderthal, the other is a Denisovan, and the thir for a third is a human. And as you can see that the human genome contains bits and pieces of the Neanderthal and the Denisovan genomes. Um, when um, we looked at this and when we were doing our work, we also um, were doing our work not only in mainland India, but also uh, we had uh, uh, I collected DNA sequences, uh, DNA, from the Jarwas and the Ongis, who are a tribal population that live in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Um, what we found in the Jarwas and the Ongis was two pieces of DNA of significant length, uh, which I've uh, denoted as yellow here. Now, yellow is not available here, is not available in the Denisovan genome, so we were wondering where these yellow bits and pieces come from, came from. So one of the first things that we did was to look at mainland India. It's quite possible that the Jarvas and the Ongis, uh, or, or some of the mainland Indian populations, um, left their DNA in among the Jarvas and the Ongis through whatever kind of mating. And so uh, we looked at mainland India and we looked for evidence for these small pieces of yellow in, in populations of mainland India, and we couldn't find any. Then we said that, okay, so we couldn't find in mainland India, but when do these? Uh, when did these yellow pieces exist? There are interesting statistical ways of figuring out from DNA sequences to time these pieces. And when we look at the evolutionary history of these two pieces of DNA, they went back to the time when the Neanderthals and Denisovans were uh, walking on the surface of this earth. So uh, this this became an enigma because these these did not these yellow pieces did not belong to the Neanderthals or the Denisovans. They were not present in mainland India. Where did they come from? The next thing that we said is that let's look in Southeast Asia. Well, when we looked at Southeast Asia, we did find that there are some populations that had um, you know these yellow pieces. However. These yellow pieces could not have come from Southeast Asian populations because the timing was wrong. The timing went back to the time of the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and modern humans appeared after the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. So what we posited was that these pieces came from an unknown hominin similar to another cousin of ours that existed, uh, that, that, that existed on, the, uh, on the surface of the earth around the same time when Neanderthals and Denisovans were walking the surface of the earth and they also interbreast with the humans and that's how these, uh, these uh, little pieces came about. And uh, the reason why Southeast Asia, uh, some of the Southeast Asian tribal populations got these yellow pieces is because that particular hominin was probably walking or probably um, uh, prevalent, uh, more densely populated in the Southeast Asian region than in Europe or Asia, other parts of Asia. Interesting, so we published this paper uh, last year in Nature Genetics, and um, anyway, I'm not going to explain this. So that, that's where uh, the, the study was published, uh, which uh, essentially showed the power of DNA evidence where even without identifying or discovering a fossil, you can make a statement on human evolution. You can uh, say that there was yet another cousin of ours whose fossil evidence, fossil we have not found, but the DNA evidence shows that there, there must have been another cousin. And fossils, uh, uh, it's only a chance finding. So you can't plan uh, discovery of new fossils. It's only a chance finding, but you can plan DNA uh, evidence. So this was published in uh, September. Our paper was published in September of last year. Every year in October, the American Society of Human Genetics meets in different parts of the uh, United States. Uh, and they have their annual meeting, like we're having our annual meeting of the DNA Society here. And there was a, um, there, there was a poster that was uh, um, presented in the American Society meeting. And the title of the poster is A Complex History of Archaic Admixture in Modern Humans. Uh, I'm not going to get into the bony details of this, but essentially this is what the paper said. This is Melanesia, which is uh, north of Australia, and there are many tribal populations there, and these, these are the tribal populations of Melanesia. What they found is something very similar to ours, which is they did a DNA study and found that um, their, uh, the, the uh, DNA sequences of the Melanesians also contain bits and pieces of DNA that 
they, they, that they could not attribute either to the Neanderthal or the Denisovan. So essentially what they concluded was that it reveals that ancient Melanesians interbred with a mysterious hominid. Very similar to what our finding was. And by the way, if you look at Andaman and Nicobar Islands, it's right here. When we moved out of Africa, we uh, came along the coastline of India, went and populated uh, um, uh, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and then moved on to populate Papua New Guinea, Melanesia and so on and so forth. So uh, we have to remember, put that in geographical context. Uh, this They have not published their full paper yet and we are very curious if they release the DNA sequences uh, of these Melanesians, then we should be able to figure out whether the yellow pieces that we found in the, the DNAs, uh, DNAs of the Jarwas and the Ongis are similar or similar or same as the ones, the bits and pieces that they found in the Melanesian um, uh, genomes and that would actually uh, clinch the controversy right now because there is a controversy right now because no um, fossil remain has been found and unless fossil remains are found archaeologists don't don't believe this but um, I for one uh, believe that the DNA evidence is more clinching uh, than uh, a broken skull or a broken bone but this will really be the proof of uh, um, proof of the concept that you can study DNA evidence get to another population and find similar bits and pieces that do not belong to uh, Neanderthals and Indonesians, and therefore um, is more clinching that this, there was probably a, a hominid that was walking uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, I'll come to um, near time. Uh, we are unusual animals. We have a wide geographical distribution. There is no corner of this earth that we have not actually populated. We have adapted ourselves to a wide range of environmental conditions. Uh, one major critical feature of the humans is that we choose mates from within our own group, however we define our group. Um, as a result of humans tending to mate within their own group, Genetic variations tend to remain localized within groups, so we form groups. Um, these groups evolve, they accumulate mutations, but there is the, the groups remain isolated and there is, there is no exchange of genes from one group to another. And that's the reason why genetic variations that arise within the group tend to remain localized within the group. And these groups, therefore, uh, retain some um, measure of genetic distinctiveness. Uh, the, the group signatures arise as a result of this isolation. And uh, uh, if we want to look at evolution of, of populations over time, even though evolutionary reconstruction is usually looking backward in time, if we uh, want to look forward in time, it fixes our ideas better. So let's look forward in time. Here is a, here is a, a population of humans. Uh, this is conceptual, cartoons, uh, we are looking forward in time, this group of individuals demographically expands. This group of individuals is thriving on nuts and berries and killing deer, hare, etc. And uh, when the, the group, when there is increase in numerical size of the group, there is pressure on natural resources. So there is there are more mouths to feed, but natural resources are limited. So one of the things that we have done, our ancestors have done, is to break up, break away from this big group. When the, when the group gets bigger and go to a new place and settle down there. So this is what happened, um, our, our most plausible scenario. So two groups, one group remained there, the other group, this is the splinter group that came out of this. The process repeats itself. That group again became uh, larger and then we moved. And so these are the contemporary populations that are isolated from each other, geographically isolated from each other, and therefore they uh, evolve certain kinds of genetic distinctiveness. Sometimes there is, there is exchange of genes between the two uh, groups, and this uh, uh, genetic exchange is called admixture, and admixture uh, results in homogenization, genetic homo homogenization of these uh, of the groups. So that, that's what has happened in the recent past. We, uh, in the past, we of course don't look forward in time. We look at the contemporary populations and look backward in time. So two groups that are genetically more similar to each other probably had a common ancestor in more recent times, and two groups groups that are quite dissimilar from each other could not have had a, uh, an ancestor in the more recent time, eventually everybody will go back to one single common ancestor because we all evolved in Africa uh, from a small group of individuals. Uh, I said uh, homogenization takes place because of admixture, but there, is, there are barriers to admixture, which is why we remain isolated. One major barrier is geographical barrier. So imagine, if you will, that two groups are on two sides of the Himalayan mountain belt. There's no school 
scope of um, exchange of meat. So the, that is a major barrier to admixture. Um, the second barrier to admixture is cu our cultural differences. Um, if you don't have have similar cultural um, context, then you generally don't, don't uh, tend to marry and uh, procreate. And uh, the third major uh, reason, uh, third major barrier to admixture is uh, linguistic difference. Um, we expect that older populations should have a should possess a greater within population genetic diversity. The amount of diversity within a population, that is, between individuals within a population, must be higher if the population is older. And why? Because that population has evolved for a longer period of time, has accumulated many more mutations, and therefore, there must be greater variation, greater inter-individual uh, variation within the population um, if the population is old. So if you look at inter uh, within population genetic diversity, uh, and we look at the amount of diversity within Africa, of course African populations have the highest amount of genetic diversity. Because we evolved in Africa, the African populations are the oldest. What's the second highest? The second highest diversity that we see is Asia. So humankind came out of Africa and populated Asia. One of, again, I don't have the, um, Maybe I have a graph. Uh, one of the uh, land masses that uh, uh, humans occupied after they came out of Africa is that they came into India. So India is the second cradle of human evolution. Um, if you look at uh, the other parts of the world, you see that there's significant drop in within population genetic diversity, which means that these, pop these land masses were inhabited by humans much more recently um, uh, than uh, humans uh, occupied Asia. Um, as we can see from here. This is uh, the uh, Y chromosomal DNA, and these are signatures of the Y chromosomal DNA. So if you look at the sequence of Y chromosome, you find distinctive uh, signatures on the Y chromosome. These distinctive signatures can be dated. So these are older signatures, and these are newer signatures. I'm not getting into the composition of these signatures. These are, of course, like uh, Professor Ghosh was talking about, barcodes. It's uh, These barcodes are uh, can, can also be thought, thought of as signatures. So these are like barcodes on the Y chromosome, but they're really signatures of humans. So um, uh, groups of humans. So if you, one, can, one can phylogenetically uh, relate these uh, signatures, and these are the older signatures, and these are the newer signatures. Supposing we look at the distribution of these Y chromosomal signatures on, 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 the, on the face of the Earth that various human populations um, occupy, this is what we see. I'm not going to have you read everything here. Just look at the colors. So essentially, let's look at one particular pie. Let's say this pie. So essentially, uh, what you have is uh, uh, this is color coded, and these are also color coded. So this is the these are the freak, relative frequencies of uh, three different signatures that occupy Australia, most of Australia. What am I wanting you to see? I'm wanting you to uh, sort of sweep your eyes from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Why? Because the left-hand side are the older signatures, and the right-hand side are the newer signatures. If you sweep your eyeballs from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, what do you see? You see a concentration of the older signatures here, like these colors here, and you find a concentration of the newer signature, like this color, predominantly in the new world. So what it means is that the older signatures are concentrated in Africa, testifying that we evolved in Africa, and then as we moved out of Africa, we crossed the Bering Strait about 15, 20,000 years ago. At that time, Bering Strait was landlocked, so we could walk over the Bering Strait and go and uh, uh, occupy the New World. The, uh, the uh, all of the middle-aged uh, haplo these are called haplogroups. All of the middle-aged signatures are actually in Asia. So we evolved in Africa, we moved to Asia, and then we went and populated the New World. We came out of Africa about between 60 and 80,000 years ago, and we populated the newest territories about 15 to 20,000 years ago. So it took us about 40,000 years to occupy this landmass. Yeah? This is Y chromosomal DNA. This is main movement. 
Let's look at female movement. This is mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA uh, is a record of female movement. So if you look at female movement, it's arranged exactly the same way. Left hand side are the older mitochondrial DNA signatures, right hand side are the newer mitochondrial DNA signatures. Plot, it's exactly the same uh, picture that you see. The oldest ones are in Africa, oldest signatures are in Africa, the newest signatures are in the New World, and all of this landmass is occupied by uh, Middle Aged signatures. So again, a completely consistent with uh, the reconstruction of human evolution, which is um, uh, that Africa was uh, populated first, that's where we uh, evolved from, and the New World was um, populated last, and most of Asia was populated after we came out of Africa, and again, I don't have the scope to uh, dig deep into this. If you look at uh, the signatures, the ages of the signatures, the second highest ages of the sig uh, of, uh, signatures that you'll find is in India, and so India was populated um, uh, very, very shortly after humankind came out of Africa. Uh, in India, we have uh, tribal populations and we have caste populations. The tribal populations, these are some of the names of the tribal populations. In the Northeast, you will recognize these names, Mizos and Tripuris and uh, Riyans, etc. They all speak tibeto burman languages. So there are other tribal populations that speak Austroasiatic languages. Uh, the Khasi is the uh, Austroasiatic speakers in Northeast of India. Uh, Santals, Mundas, Lodhas, these are all in Central and East India. So Austroasiatic languages are primarily in northeast India uh, and in, um, uh, south, uh, in east and central India. Dravidian languages, these are tribal populations from southern India. And uh, there's one population that we know of, the, uh, a tribal population that speaks an Indo-European language. But most of us believe that this is not an original tongue. It was probably imposed on them. So the tribal populations uh, probably are not Indo-European speakers. If you look at caste populations, uh, South India, Dravidian populations, northeast of India, Tibeto-Burman speakers, uh, northern India, all of them are Indo-European speakers. So you will notice that the tribal populations don't speak Indo-European language, and you will also notice that the caste populations don't speak Austroasiatic language. Caste, uh, the Austroasiatic language is spoken exclusively by the tribals of India. Um, this, uh, you remember this, there's of, of course a confounding between geography and language. Uh, South India is Dravidian, North India is the fragmented language family is Austroasiatic. You find some uh, populations in the northeast and some populations in eastern Central Asia, uh, Central India that speak Austroasiatic language, again exclusively by the tribals. Uh, I'm going to skip this for, uh, well, I, I, I'll just point out one little thing, um, which is that uh, a few years ago, we um, formed a consortium and we looked at uh, evolution of uh, human populations or structure of human population in all of Asia. And uh, this is all of Asia, a large number of populations, and this is the genetic relationship among these populations. Suffice it to say, as we move from uh, b bottom to the top, these are the older populations and this, these are the newest populations. This black population is African populations. Where is India? So this is where India is. India branched off early on. And uh, um, so this is, there's an early uh, divergence from um, the, uh, from the um, African populations, which again testifies to the fact that Indian populations are a cradle of, uh, are, is the, India is the second cradle of human evolution. And if you look at uh, um, the populations of India, and there are about 10 populations of India, some from North and East India and some from South India, and you've uh, essentially, I'll explain this kind of picture in a little bit more detail uh, in, in a minute. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that there is of course a, a, a big distinction between the North Indian populations and the South Indian populations as you can see from this color coding. I'm not going to explain the rest of the picture. The rest of the picture is also quite interesting. It uh, tells us about the Chinese and its, their relationship to the Japanese, etc. But that's beyond the scope of today's talk. Um, I have actually explained this. These are numbers. So one of the um, questions that one's interested in is that, of course, uh, India is the second cradle of human evolution. But having said that, uh, we didn't arise de novo, right? There have been migrations of people from uh, other parts of, uh, of, of the world over a period of time. And uh, so today we have a large number of contemporary populations, about 4,000 caste and subcaste populations, about 400 tribal populations, etc. Uh, we would like to know how many distinct ancestral types have admixed in order to form the uh, to contemporary populations of India. 
Um, we asked this question as we were doing our work. We were scooped, and this, we were scooped by uh, two groups: a, a collaborating group between um, uh, the um, between Boston and Hyderabad, CCMB group, and the Broad Institute group. They pub they scooped us and published a paper um, which is called "Reconstructing Indian Population History." And their model, they propounded the following model. They essentially said that all of mainland India was. Uh, uh, populated or uh, is a result of an admixture between an ancestral North Indian and an ancestral South Indian population. So they essentially concluded that there are two ancestral types that make up all of India. Uh, we didn't believe this at all. We, we, we thought that this was an underestimate of the number of ancestral types, essentially because first, they didn't have samples of any tribal population, and you can't reconstruct human evolution in India without including the tribes. For sure, we know that the tribal populations are older than the caste populations. Second, they didn't even have one population from the northeastern part of India, and we know that the northeastern part of India has a, 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 a unique population history. And so you can't uh, uh, remove the northeastern part of India and say that uh, and make a statement on, uh, uh, on, on India, reconstructing Indian population history. While they, this paper was published, we had already begun our work and our representation of samples was much better. Uh, um, and uh, um, and we were uh, generating almost the same kind of data, which is genome scale data, about one million markers for every individual across the genome. Um, suffice it to say, the first point that I will make is that we also had uh, um, uh, samples from the Jarwas and the Ongis, who are uh, inhabitants of um, uh, of uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And again, I'm not going to explain what this graph is all about. For those, I will just make one statement. This is principal component one. This is principal component two. Uh, those of you who understand this will have understood that what these are. So essentially, uh, what I'm saying from this graph is that however this graph is drawn, the island populations, uh, um, um, the Jarwas and the Ongis stand out from the mainland populations. Each dot here represents an individual. So what you see is that all of these these are Jarwas and Ongi individuals, and there is no Jarwa and Ongi individual represented in this part of the graph. These are all populations or individuals who belong to various, various populations of mainland India. The second point that I will make is that, and I'll justify this, um, uh, remember the previous paper said that there are two ancestral types, and what we eventually found was that you can explain all of the genetic diversity in India. The island populations have a separate ancestral history. Now we are looking at mainland India. If you look at mainland India, it's not two, but four ancestral types are required in order to explain the genetic diversity of mainland India. And our uh, evidence comes from here. So let me explain this figure. This was also the figure that was turned around in that, in that uh, uh, Pan-Asian paper that I showed you, or uh, figure that I showed you. There are many, many, many uh, dots here. Um, each dot represents an individual, and each column uh, here, the vertical bar, represents a signature, an ancestral signature. Again, I'm not going to explain these, these are all done statistically. The first thing that we do is ask ourselves, for this genetic data, how many ancestral types do you need to explain all of the data? Um, Two doesn't suffice, three didn't suffice, four sufficed, and that's the minimum number of components that you need in order to explain the genetic diversity. So there are four ancestral populations. These four ancestral populations are actually represented as four uh, colors. If you see some of these individuals, these individuals are so-called pure, um, essentially completely green. But if you look at some of these individuals, these individuals are highly admixed. You have the red, the green, the blue, and the sky blue. Right? So these individuals are highly admixed because they, their genomes contain four different kinds of signatures. Similarly, if you come here, these individuals are essentially unadmixed, pure, whatever they are. What are they? So this is what they are. We, we were able to identify the green signature with Indo-European. We were able to identify the red signature with Dravidian. So this is North India. The green is North India. The red is South India. These are Austroasiatic speakers who are highly admixed. As you know, that uh, like I told you, that they're very fragmented. Um, the Khasis in Northeast India and the Santals and the Mundas in uh, East and Central India. Uh, over a period of time, for whatever reason, there is much greater admixture among the Austroasiatics than among the other uh, tribal populations. And these are the Tibeto-Burmans, some of whom are admixed to a certain degree, but m the vast majority of them are actually 
impure in some ways, unadmixed more or less. So because uh, of the geographical um, uh, shelter, uh, shelter is not the right word, um, uh, whatever, they, they, they occupy a corner of the Indian land mass, and therefore there's been much less population admixture in the Northeast, and that's the reason why you find human diversity here to be so large, because there are multiple smaller fragmented groups who are essentially unadmixed. So these are the four components of the um, uh, of mainland Indian ancestral populations that we have discovered, and it's not two. Um, this was published, uh, I think, last year in PNAS. Uh, I'm actually going to stop here, and I want to, um, yeah, don't want to um, move on. I'm going to sk uh, skip all of this. I was going to relate culture with genes, but uh, um, it's okay. This is my most important slide, and I'm going to read it out to you. Um, this is from a poet, an African-American poet. Her name is Maya Angelou. And this is the uh, book of poetry that she's written many books. But this is from this book called Wouldn't Take Anything for My Journey Now. Uh, so I'm going to read it out to you because this is my most important slide. It's time for the preachers, the rabbis, the priests and pundits, and the professors to believe in the awesome wonder of diversity so that they can teach them, teach those who follow them. It's time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. We all should know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry. And we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter their color, equal in importance, no matter their texture. Thank you very much.